at 730, so we can get out uh, close to 820. Uh, anybody have any questions from before? Um, so far as handouts, um, the we had to get some other, extra copies made. Jerry said they'd be done by this afternoon. So if you haven't got the handouts for both 337, well, actually, we haven't had a handout to anyone, 3371 handouts yet. And they will be ready this afternoon. If you haven't got the 337 handouts, I think Jerry may have enough of those already. Uh, but you should see her sometime today or tomorrow. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of confusion about the difference between 337 and 3371. In the past, 3371 was taught from 830 to 9. And 337, those 25 lectures were taught um, uh, from 7.30 to 8.30. Because the 13A students took the 3371 lectures this summer, they, they've been video, videotaped. And for example, next week, I'm out of town Monday through Thursday, but we will show the 3371 videotape 7.30 to 8, 8.30, or 7.30, 8.20, here on those four days. There's 12 lectures, and so the days that I have to be out of town uh, which is usually about four days in a week, but just uh, that's what happened. Um, you can watch 3371. So this year, if anybody, I mean, the, the work requirements for the course, two courses are identical. So if you want to come every morning and get breakfast, you might as well sign up for the nine units rather than the six units. Uh, but that's up to you. Um, the difference, 337 is going to go through lots of different welding and joining processes from cold welding and soldering and brazing and laser and electron beam, diffusion bonding, arc welding, and talk about the process of chemistry and physics. 3371 is actually a fabrication course designed for the Navy, Navy construction officers or Navy engineering officers. And it talks about material selection, which is fairly general, although I kind of emphasize steels a lot because that's what you build ships out of. Um, but I actually explain why steels are used a lot. Uh, I go through fracture mechanics and how to analyze failures. And I go through some non-destructive testing and also some welding metallurgy in 3371. So if you're interested in that. Um, otherwise, you don't have to come next Monday through Thursday. Um, but next Friday, I will be lecturing live. Um, to uh, usually try to review what we did the last time. And by the way, the 3371 lectures are a series of 12 continu continuous lectures that follow each other. The 337 lectures are a series of 24 or 25 lectures that hopefully follow each other. But what we talked about last time is why bother studying welding and joining. I mentioned it's integrative. It'll bring together lots of different disciplines that you've studied. It's increased the size, reduced the cost, and improved the re re reliability and life of what we build. It's ubiquitous. And I gave you a homework assignment. What's the largest standalone manufactured object you can think of that doesn't contain a joint? And yesterday, I brought you all the way up to a frying pan. Anyone, and also, I think I gave you Professor McClintock's anvil. Uh, anybody come up with anything and think about it? Yep. A structural beam. Uh, except the structural beam usually is part of a larger system that has to be joined to all the other beams, right? So yeah, it's big, but it's usually so. Uh, Jeremy. Maybe a Native American canoe. Okay. Yep. Um, although they often put seats in them, right? Which going across, right? I don't know. It depends on the natives if they want to just sit on their knees, uh, you know, uh, on a bearskin or something. Uh, but yeah, actually, where was I? I was in Whitehorse in the Yukon this summer, and they had these big hollowed out canoes. And it was one solid log um, that they had uh, hollowed out that was as long as this room, or as wide, so far as that goes. So that's a pretty good sized object. OK. Anybody come up with anything else? <clears throat> yep. I don't disagree with me about the definition of joints, but I thought it was an igloo. An igloo? <laughs> well, um, yeah, I guess in a sense, you're basically stacking things. But that's not as each, I would tend to say each block is the individual object, right? Um, but if you make a big enough igloo, like an iceberg, right? It's a big big piece of something. OK. Anybody have any th other things? <clears throat> OK, well, yep. Can you scratch that's, that's true. Um, 
However, if you looked at a huge statue like the Statue of Liberty, she's full of joints, right? But she was, she was not cast in one piece. And a lot of the statues that you look at, are most of them are hollow because you can't afford that much brass. Uh, it's too expensive, it's also too heavy to move. But they actually, a lot of times, will cast the arm or the leg, and then they join those to, to another piece. So a lot of the statues you look at actually did have welds in them, okay? But you're right, if it is a single monolithic casting. In fact, if you just think of the largest casting you can think of that's used as a casting, and that's essentially what you were doing there. So there are probably statues that are six or eight feet tall that are monolithic statues. Most statues that are more than six or eight feet tall are actually joined together somewhere as individual castings that were put together. And then they have to finish the surface so you can't see the weld. But uh, uh, a lot of the bigger statues bigger than six or eight feet, but actually six or eight feet I'll buy in general, and maybe there's a bigger one, but uh, actually one of the largest ones I ever saw to talk about castings, I was in Korea once and they had these big bells that you kind of take a big log and hit the side of and the gongs in the temples, anybody from Korea? Well, anyway, one of these um, was about 10 or 12 feet high and 10 or 12 feet wide and had like a four or five inch thick wall. And that was all a single casting. So, and, and you didn't need a clapper on the inside. People said bells to me before, but you didn't need a clapper inside, which would have a joint, right? Um, but basically you just had a great big log that hit it from the side, but in a sense. So it, it you know, it gets, <clears throat> we're getting into metaphysics here on what do you decide as a standalone object. but. In any case, um, the point is, most if you went through Walmart, you would have a hard time finding something that didn't have a joint in it. Okay, most of the manufactured objects that we have um, have joints in them, uh, and the quality and reliability of that product is going to be directly re related to the quality of those joints. Because if it fails, it'll probably fail at a joint. And in fact, I mentioned the. Uh, space Shuttle Challenger, and if you want, here is a little handout that comes from a book. Actually, these books, um, uh, it's, this is just a reprint of a chapter in a book. There's three books by this guy, Edward Tufta, on how to present information, whether it's uh, graphical information or um, web information or other things. He teaches a little one-day course for $300 that uh, he makes a fortune off of. He used to be a professor at Yale. But he has two examples in here of how to display data. One's a good example, one's a bad example. The good example is the beginning of epidemiology, as he claims, which is the um, was a malaria epidemic in, uh, no, with malaria, cholera epidemic in London in 1856, where all of a sudden people were getting cholera in London, and um, this one medical doctor went out and essentially plotted where the people had lived when they, the people who died, and concluded that all the, that somehow the cholera was related to this water pump. And we do know now that um, cholera is transmitted in water, the cholera bacteria is transmitted in, in the water that people wash with and drink and, and whatnot and cook with. And so he put a, he had the authorities put a chain on the handle of the water pump and the deaths decreased. And supposedly he claims that's the beginning of modern epidemiological studies. Uh, and he, it's a good example because he's got a nice picture there. You want to hold that up? You got the map right there so people can see. That, that's the map of where the deaths were. And it all kind of circles around, the data clusters around the, the, the pump, a single pump. There are multiple water pumps in London, but uh, so Tufta goes through and explains how, that's how he concluded this. Then he goes through and later says, well, it may have been fortuitous, <laughs> that he may not have really proved it, but it doesn't really matter. The data tended to show the connection. Then they go through the second, part of this chapter is the Space Shuttle, Ch Shuttle Challenger. And he actually goes through and shows you the actual overheads that were used by Morton Thiokol the night before the launch. What happened, if any of you have heard the story before, is it was very cold in January. They were supposed to launch, unusually cold in Florida, freezing condition, icicles on the, 
on the uh, on the the space launch uh, um, structure, and some people were very concerned about the O-rings, and said these O-rings may not hold in the cold weather, and NASA really NASA's management really wanted to have this flight go on a scheduled time, and Morton Thiokol sent a uh, listen. Their manager sent, listened to their engineers' concerns sent a message to NASA saying, we don't think you should launch tomorrow because of the cold weather. And NASA's manager sent back a memo saying, we think you need to rethink this, okay? Which basically says, we don't like your suggestion. Tell us another one, right? This is sort of like accounting at Enron, you know, or something. Um, uh, and actually, WorldCom, I guess, is, you know, as Chris says, how can you just kind of miss $5 billion, you know? You know, you, you might lose $5 out of your pocket, but. It's a little harder to explain missing five billion, but um, in any case, it actually goes through the overheads that were used by the engineers and why they didn't see the data. And if they had plotted the data another way, it would have been obvious that you should have expected a failure. Um, but in fact, he points out that the the presentation didn't have anybody's name on it. You know, the cover, the first slide didn't. No one was willing to take credit for this presentation because the engineers already had given their recommendation, which was not to launch, and management says, we don't like that answer. We want another answer. And so they got another answer. Um, and unfortunately, it uh, was a fairly serious answer. Um, okay, so there's, I went through, actually I didn't actually go through, I think I kind of skipped, that Welding is a relatively large fraction of manufactured costs, and I put this up on the board, but I didn't finish it yesterday. Does anybody have an idea of what fraction of, if you're building a large structure, whether it's a building, a ship, uh, an automobile, um, what fraction of that is the raw materials that go into building the structure, of the total cost as a percentage? Seven six, okay. I, I'm, I'm not quite that precise. Um, oops. I put down ten to twenty percent. Now, I actually have an overhead somewhere else that says ten to thirty percent for a pipeline, a gas pipeline or oil pipeline you're going to bury in the ground. The actual cost of the pipe is typically about thirty percent of the cost of a pipeline. But a pipeline is pretty simple. You just kind of stick pipes, weld them together, and put them in the ground. For most things, if you were to look at an automobile, it costs twenty thousand dollars. There's about two thousand dollars worth of raw material: steel, plastic, foam, and things in there. Now, the welding and joining technology is probably also going to be another ten to twenty percent of the total cost, equal to the cost of buying the material, raw material. Other fabrication is going to be another ten to twenty percent. Non-destructive testing, which is not something you do uh, in automobiles, which is mass-produced so much, but if you're talking buildings or, or bridges or uh, uh, ships or things like that, uh, is also another 10 to 20 percent. And GNA, what's GNA stand for? Anybody know? Pardon me? Yep, general and administrative, and that's typically 20 to 30 percent. And what's in general and administrative? Some people call it overhead, indirect labor. It's your management, your accounting. It can be your design function of your engineering is often in there on a structure. If you add all this up, you'll get something on the order of plus 10 percent profit to minus 10 percent profit, okay? You don't always make money on everything you do. But if you want to know kind of order of magnitude where the costs of things are, up to a third of it might be G&A, which is overhead. But everything, these other four are roughly equal. And you know, there's some variation for each structure. But a lot of people are surprised, particularly people in materials, science and engineering, in my department, are surprised to learn that the actual, manuf as manufactured cost, the materials cost is a relatively small fraction of the whole thing. And my argument there is, well, you ought to use decent materials if they're going to improve your productivity later. And you can argue that on each one of these, uh, if you get an improvement in productivity because of that. 
Um, now, the other, another, we also talked about, uh, there's lots of failures, to give you an idea of failures. Um, one failure, which is, that occurred um, back in 1980 was the Alexander Keeland disaster. Anyone ever heard of the Alexander Keeland disaster? This is a book called Introduction to the Physical Metallurgy of Welding by Kenneth Easterling, and Easterling was from Sweden. And the Alexander Keelan was a offshore platform in the North Sea. Uh, it had originally been designed to drill for oil in the North Sea, but it had been converted to a hotel. So the workmen, this was basically a, a platform where, where people were sleeping when they were not working out in the North Sea. On the evening of 27th of March, 1980, a couple of minutes before 6.30 p.m., the Alexander Keelan, a drilling rig converted into an accommodation platform located in the North Sea, started to capsize and within 20 minutes had overturned, killing 123 of the 212 people on board. Well, this was in the, North, the Norwegian part of the North Sea. And in fact, the Norwegians, of course, were very upset, uh, such a major disaster, and they convened a board of inquiry and the Board of Inquiry basically determined the cause. In this case, this was the, the original drilling platform, several different views. If you look down from the top, it was a five-legged platform, and it had these, at which particular, whatever particular cross-section you might uh, look at, it might have stiffeners between the legs like this, or they might be arranged more like this. Um, in any case, it's not, not, that's not that important, but that just gives you some perspective. If you look at several of these legs, and this, this type of connection here, it turns out uh, on one of these stiffeners across here, which, and by the way, these, these legs might be 30 feet in diameter. These are not small, okay? This is probably, if you were to build this today, at the time, I think it was about a $200 million rig, if you build it today, it might be a half billion dollar rig. Um, but what had happened is they had this, this little, little pipe here, which might be six feet in diameter or something. And off the end of that, they had welded this little bracket, another tube with a flange, for a sonar transducer. It turns out they never used the sonar transducer. But they thought they were going to, and so the, in the shipyard, they had put this on here. And it turns out when they welded this little flange and pipe, this pipe and flange, to the outside shell, or which is this tube right here. They put some fillet welds in here, and they didn't consider this a structural weld. I mean, the structural welds were the ones that were tying the stiffeners to the legs. What happened, um, unfortunately, was since they had in the shipyard, the way they managed the shipyard, all the structural welding came under a certain organization, and then the kind of the attachment things were under the maintenance organization, the people who fixed the plumbing and stuff in the shipyard. And in this, the shipyard was in France, this little sonar thing was assigned to the maintenance folks. Well, the maintenance folks didn't have all the kind of quality control and metallurgical knowledge of welding, and they just went to, they were supposed to put on this, uh, this pipe, which was, um, 483 millimeters, so we're talking about a 16 inch diameter pipe. This, this little pipe is 16 inches in diameter. If you look at that 16 inches compared to that, you can see these are big structures, right? Uh, anyway, they, they, went, they went to the maintenance department and they got a pipe that was the right diameter and they brought it out and they welded it on and everything was fine, they thought, except there was no metallurgical control on the composition of the steel. Turns out this was a high carbon steel. Well, as on the structural side, they would have had mill certs and everything else, and no one would have would have done any welding on anything unless they knew exactly what the material was. So, here's this little pipe welded into the big bigger piece. This is the bigger piece. Uh, here it is down here, with the little fillet welds, and they could see fatigue cracks running through this and going around until it basically broke through, um, and it, that broke through. A fatigue crack ran. Actually, fatigue crack started here, ran, I'm sorry, started here, and it ran to one of these legs and ran all the way around one of these legs. I mean, this was a long fatigue crack. Interestingly enough, 
Two weeks before, some divers had been down who supposedly had done an inspection. Of course, they probably decided, ah, it's probably good, we don't need to inspect it, we'll just sign off that we did. Okay, um, things like that happened. And in fact, the leg came off and with it was a, a stormy night and it was a dark and stormy night as they say, and the whole thing uh, collapsed um, and killed 123 people. Turns out this book called Engineering Catastrophes was written by John Lancaster. John Lancaster wrote some other books, one called The Physics of Welding, and then he's got a book, Welding Metallurgy, which is in its sixth, sixth edition. Um, so it's sort of significant that later in his life he took his welding knowledge and started talking about engineering catastrophes. So he, he talks about the Alexander Keelan, as does Kenneth Easterling in both these books. Uh, Lancaster's book also talks about the British uh, Comet aircraft in the 1950s. Anybody know what happened with the Comets? And these were some of the first jets to fly across the Atlantic in the 1950s. And every now and then they didn't make it all the way across. They only made it about halfway until they dove into the ocean. Uh, what happened with comets is they had sort of square riveted windows. And so this was a window that was nice and square. Here's the design of the window. And you had a stress concentration, even though it was rounded, but it wasn't rounded enough. And you had all these rivets up here. And around the rivets, well, you don't need to see that. Um, <clears throat> around the rivets, you would get little cracks. And the skin fatigue cracks would grow from those rivet holes because of the stress concentration around the, uh, the windows of the comet. And the problem was these things were falling into the Atlantic. And in the middle of the Atlantic, you couldn't recover it back in the 1950s. We probably could today, but uh, back then they couldn't recover it. So they didn't really have anything to do with failure analysis. And they actually lost, I don't remember, it was three or four aircraft before someone finally figured out what was causing it. Uh, and then they started inspecting and they found the cracks and stuff. And they ended up redesigning. It's, it's the, the comet is sort of a classic study of poor design leading to failures. So there's some fairly major failures, and he goes through some others. There's an explosion that occurred in a chemical plant in England that uh, is fairly famous uh, so far as that goes. Um, so there are many failures that occur due to welding uh, or joining. Um, it's a complex process. Few in, I mentioned few engineers are trained. And one thing I didn't mention yesterday was the fact that our inability to join new materials often limits the application of those materials in the real world. For example, the most common, most commonly welded material in the world is steel. 95 pounds out of every 100 pounds of metal made in the world is steel. And you'll hear next week in the 371 lectures ad nauseum about why that's true. This is a weld in steel. This happens to be one inch thick, HY80. This weld was made down at General Dynamics Electric Boat. It's basically a submarine. I won't tell you it's a hull because that's not the thickness of the hull. And if I told you the thickness of the hull, I'd have to shoot you because it's classified. If you know the diameter of the submarine, you know the thickness of the, the wall of the hull. You calculate the maximum depth, and that's classified. Okay. Uh, so I can't tell you. I know what it is, but I can't tell you. Uh, but I didn't learn it from classified information. <clears throat> but anyway, you can learn all. Most things that are classified, you can figure out other ways uh, in non-classified ways. This is a weld in a piece of titanium. I'm just kind of give you some examples of different welds and different joints. This is a weld in a piece of titanium. This titanium is about two inches thick. This is what we call an electroslag weld. That's basically one of the ways the Soviets built their titanium submarines. We've never built titanium submarines bigger than about 10 feet in diameter, which are little research vessels. Uh, and the reason is, as the Soviets learned, the Soviets went and built full-size the Alpha Sub in 1980. And the United States was very, very concerned because the Alpha Sub could dive deeper than the collapse depth of our depth charges. It could go underwater faster than the surface speed of our destroyers. Um, and everyone was all worried. And if you read, what's Tom Clancy's book um, in the movie? Red October. Red October, Hunt for Red October. It talks about the Alpha Sub, okay, which is one of the attack, Soviet attack subs. Within about two or three years after they came out with the Alpha Sub, they put them in, put them in dock 
because they, had, they were full of cracks. And it had to do with something called the Crete Fatigue Interaction, which the U.S. Navy had, knew about, that when you put a lot of stress on the submarine, when you put it under the water, um, it turns out, and you do that cyclically, uh, and you can maintain the stress for a long period of time, titanium has this property that there's an interaction and you get much faster fatigue crack growth rate. Uh, and so the Navy had never figured out, the U.S. Navy had never figured out how to design around this problem, and they were really surprised when the Soviets had solved this problem, they thought, because <laughs> they built a whole new submarine, right? Except the Soviets never discovered the problem until they built the whole new submarine. Um, and given the fact that a titanium submarine costs about 10 times what a regular sub costs, uh, a full-size attack sub at the height of the Cold War, the HME, Hull Mechanical and Electrical, was about a half a billion dollars. The whole sub was two billion, but that includes the missiles and everything else and all the, all the electronics. But the actual hull, mechanical and electrical, was about a half a billion dollars. If you were to do that in titanium, you'd probably be talking five billion dollars just to build that. So you'd be talking about the price of a nuclear aircraft carrier. Um, anyway, um, to give you an idea of some other structures um, or things we'll talk about, I, talked, I mentioned that some materials are not, may have absolutely outstanding mechanical properties and, and people say, oh, we're going we're gonna to use this new material for some, some application. But the problem is they really don't know how to join it. And this actually is a piece from the, um, from the wall of the X-33 space plane. The X-33 space plane was an experimental vehicle being built by NASA, and it was to go into low it was, not, it, was, it was to replace the space shuttle. The X-33 was single-staged orbit. You know, the, the space shuttle takes off and it drops its uh, main tank and, it, and then they recover the solid rocket things. Well, that's multi-staged orbit because you're dropping off these other fuel things. And the X-33 was supposed to drop the cost of getting into space from $10,000 a pound per pound of pay payload to $1,000. Now. Think about that. $10,000 a pound is what it costs you to put something in space. I'm going to put a satellite up there, and it weighs 100 pounds. That's $10 million. Now, typically, the satellite will weigh 1,000 pounds, and the typical cost of a telecommunication satellite is about $100 million to put it up there. In any case, they were trying to drop the cost by a factor of 10, so they designed the X-33 space plane. In order to be single-staged orbit, you've got to have light weight. And that means you got to go to some sort of composite structure. So they built two liquid hydrogen, the, the fuel, hydrogen is nice and light as a fuel. They built two liquid hydrogen storage tanks, about double the size of this room in volume. Okay? Uh, small house uh, sort of size, actually larger than double the size of this room. It was kind of a small two story bungalow or something. Um, and they tested one of them in Huntsville, Alabama, and filled it up with liquid hydrogen. And as they were warming it back up, the skin peeled off. And the skin consists of a, it's actually Nomex, which is a different brand, but basically Kevlar, if you've ever heard of Kevlar, you know, bulletproof armor type of fiber. They make a honeycomb here. This is almost two inches thick. I think it's one three quarters or so. So they make a honeycomb, which is very light. And then they put on a carbon, um, fiber, car carbon epoxy composite skin, which is, gives it the hard outside surface. They also had one on the inside, but it, that's what peeled off. The whole structure only weighed 4,000 pounds. I mean, it's the size of a small house, and it holds liquid hydrogen, and it's got all these invar and titanium uh, nozzles and, and uh, tubes and penetrations and stuff for the structure. How much do you think it cost? to build that structure. It was adhesively bonded, and the adhesive joint failed. And they canceled the $1.3 billion project because of that. But that 4,000-pound structure cost $50 million. They had to build two of them, so it cost $100 million to build two of them. And if you want to buy one, there's one sitting out in Palmdale at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. They'd love to sell it to you for $50 million because they don't have anything else to do with it. Um, actually, they'd probably sell it to you for $1 million, um, if the government would let them. But anyway, what, the whole thing was adhesively bonded. There were problems with the adhesive bonding, and it didn't, 
achieve the strength of the adhesive bond that they had hoped. And so when they took it up or put it in liquid hydrogen and had all those thermal stresses, the whole thing failed. And they canceled the program. Um, this next one is another thing that had a problem with thermal stresses. This is a brazed stainless steel part of a heat exchanger. If you look at this, you'll see big holes going through this way, and you'll see little holes going through this way. And so this is a heat exchanger. This heat exchanger was about twice the size of this room. Not as big as that hydrogen tank, but it was about twice the size of this room. And it was designed for Navy ships. Uh, it's called an in internal cooled recuperator, and they have solved this problem. This was only a $300 million project. But the idea is you're burning fossil fuel in the, in the destroyers and cruisers in this battle group. And you, anybody know where, what, what ship fuels, carries the fuel for the other ships? It's the aircraft carrier. The aircraft carrier carries, it's a nuclear powered aircraft carrier, but it carries the oil for the destroyers and the cruisers that are in the battle group. And so they have to come in to the, to the ship, to the, to the aircraft carrier to refuel while they're out there cruising the ocean. And the problem is because some people have some weapons that have very long range in terms of their, <clears throat> like nuclear weapons. They, the battle group in normal formation spreads out over about 30 to 50 miles of ocean, okay? And that means that the efficiency of these fossil-fueled uh, destroyers and stuff and frigates is such they might spend 10 to 20 or 30 percent of their time just going back and forth for refueling. And so their actual on-station time is not as good as it should be. So you could save a lot of money if you could make them more efficient. And you can make them much more efficient if you recuperate some of the heat that you're blowing up the stack. And so this was just a heat exchanger that would take the outgoing exhaust and preheat the incoming air to make your whole process more efficient. And so they built one of these things. They sent it over to Rolls-Royce in England because they built the turbine that drives the ships. And they had a test stand with a full turbine. This thing was supposed to have a 100,000 hour life. So far as I could tell from serving on the panel, it lasted for two minutes before it tore itself apart due to thermal stresses. Um, now the Navy's fixed that problem and they actually are going ahead with an ICR pro project, but the initial design where they built a full-scale mock-up was not exactly su successful. In that case, it was the joints weren't necessarily bad, it was thermal stresses that tore the whole thing apart. The computer model had assumed that the gases that would come out the stack or go up the stack would go through this thing symmetrically. And so the, the Navy had a spec they wanted to heat up within 30 minutes. No. No, I think they wanted to heat up within two minutes. And a regular, they use these things at commercial gen, electrical generating stations, but they will heat up over 30 minutes. Well, if you heat something up in two minutes, it doesn't heat up uniformly. And so this thing twisted like a pretzel because of the hot gas is going through it. Uh, other types of joints, um, this is a piece of simple gas piping that you'd find under the street. If they're laying, you know, if, what do they call it, N-Star now, it used to be Boston Gas. If they were lying, laying gas pipe nowadays, it typically will be plastic pipe that is hot pressure welded together. So they, they put a, a heater on this end of the pipe and another pipe and heat up both ends and then they squeeze them together and this is the flash in between. Uh, and that, of course, has an advantage that it will never corrode. Um, the problem with gas piping right now, I live in the town of Belmont and 10 years ago, I live in an old house that was built during the Depression. Um, 10 or 15 years ago, my neighbor comes to me one, seven o'clock one Sunday morning and he says, you got water bubbling up in your front yard. And what had happened is they had planted a tree back in the 1930s right on top of the water line coming into my house. And over the next 60 years, the tree roots had, had broken the, uh, the water pipe. And so I had the, we had this coming up. And so um, later that morning, we report it. And the water department comes out that Sunday morning. And I'm sitting there watching the backhoe dig, dig up the street in front of my house to get to the water pipe. And I, I start, I smell gas. And right then, Boston Gas truck drives up. I said, what's going on here? And then the guy jumps down in the hole, takes some chewing gum out of his mouth, and plugs the hole in the gas line. Okay? I said, how did you guys know that? He says, oh, we always have to call them 
because the pipes around here are so old and so corroded that we know that when we move the dirt away from the pipes that we're going to expose one of the holes in the pipe. So the gas pipes all over the city are leaking. A few years later, about six or seven years later, Boston Gas comes through and two of the houses on the street, mine being one of them, they put little sniffers down in the ground to sniff for the gas. In mine, they determined there was a, a gas leak in my line, and they came and they relined it by just, they took the steel pipe that was there, and they just opened things up on the street and ran a plastic pipe in, uh, inside the steel pipe, and they didn't have to dig up all the rest of the yard. Uh, unfortunately, they screwed up the connection to my house. My house filled up with gas. My wife came, we went out to one of the things at the high school, some musical thing with my kids at high school. And my wife took one of the younger children back home early. She walked in, the whole house was full of gas. And we had to open the windows and everything. Anyway, so. However, I tell you, when I complained to the state about the lousy connection, I got nothing out of Boston Gas. But when I sent a letter to the state of Massachusetts, about that my house had filled up with gas, and I wanted to know when they were going to fix the, do the permanent repair, I started getting phone calls. As soon as I notified the state, Boston Gas was calling me in my office within a half an hour. And they were calling every two hours to find out if I was happy. Okay? Um, so some people think things... Pardon me? Well, fortunately, I don't smoke. But uh, if it had been back when my mother-in-law lived with me smoked, <coughs> Um, it, it was pretty bad. I've never been in a building that had that much smoke before, or that strong gas smoke. This is um, the shroud of a turbine engine, and this has a honeycomb brazed on it too, because if I have a turbine blade, just happen to have a turbine blade, um, the turbine blades are going to rotate through the shroud, and I don't want the gas to leak past the turbine blade. I want it to push against the turbine blade to, to make the turbine blade move. And so, but I have to have this thing up against, close up against something. So they actually put a very fine honeycomb, high temperature nickel base alloy that braze on the shroud. And as the blade, which actually grows longer over time as it creeps at high temperature, it actually cuts into this. And the stuff is so small that it makes a, a, a gas seal which greatly increases the, the heat of the efficiency of the engine. And you can see that what happened here was the blades kind of ran a little bit longer and a little hotter. You can actually see a, a little ledge here where the blade was cutting through it and actually formed a crack. So they quit using this. This is the blade. I'll pass this one around as well. This blade is actually, of all my little toys, is probably my uh, most one of my most prized possessions. This is a single crystal turbine blade. And I can't remember if this is in a... 757 or 767 or 747 type of engine, but it's a Pratt & Whitney 4000 series engine. This would be a single crystal of nickel-based super alloy, and when they cast it, they actually have a ceramic form on the inside that gives gas cooling passages. And what they've done is they've taken electrical discharge machining and they've filleted, they call this a filleted blade, this is just for demonstration purposes. They cut it in two so you can see the internal structure. And it has a little waffling on here to, to turbulate and create turbulence in the gas to get better cooling. A, a, a jet engine today runs, the gas going through the jet engine is around 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The melting point of the metal is around 2,400 to 2,500 Fahrenheit. The operating temperature of the metal is around 2,000 Fahrenheit. The way they do it is they basically blow 1,000 degree gas, cooling gas at 1,000 degrees, up through the blade. It comes out these little holes. Now, these little holes are laser or electron beam drilled, and we'll talk about that later in the course. I mean, it's not really welding, but how do you make very fine little holes at a funny angle in a blade like this? And you'll see some of these on this edge are coming in at a very steep angle. Um, so this is internally cooled, and the gas comes out. And as the gas comes out of these holes, it forms a little boundary layer, which is an insulating layer. So the blade never sees the 3,000 degrees. Uh, it only sees the 1,000 degree air right up against the surface. Well, actually, the air gets heated and there's turbulence and stuff. But it keeps the blade operating temperature below 2,000 degrees. This is a stator vein. Uh, in this case, this is also Pratt & Whitney. These also have little notches cut in them. Well, that one's cut in two, but it had a notch cut in it, meaning they're bad blades. 
They do that so people don't use blades that have been rejected and put them in a real engine and cause a failure. They actually cut a notch into the blade. So this one's been notched right here. So no mechanic would ever use this blade again. Anyway, in this one, you've got the same, they welded on some little things on the bottom, but the gas flows through, but the whole surface has got a ceramic coating on the surface, which will take even higher temperatures um, than the metal beneath. And so we'll talk about how people make that type of thing. Another type of application of brazing, this is actually not the product, this is a little toy that was given to me uh, two days ago. Um, but I had the real thing. These are small industrial diamonds that are lined up on here. This company, Kinnick, is a Taiwanese company, and Kin means gold, or actually, if anyone can pronounce the Chinese, it's Chin or Chin, I can't remember. Anyway, um, anybody know? Kin? Kin? In, in Japanese, it's Kin, K-I-N, uh, but in Chinese, it's Kin means gold, but it doesn't matter. The, name, the company's name is Kinnick, and that does have the same Chinese character as gold. This has been gold-plated, which is just for, for show, to give away as toys. Uh, so this guy gave me um, the toys. But this is, the diamond is brazed to the surface. Now, what they usually have is about a four-inch diameter steel, stainless steel pad, which is very flat. And when you're making semiconductors, and you have to do these, all these different layering of, you start out with a silicon wafer and you put down some copper nowadays, since IBM invented the way to do copper rather than aluminum. You put some copper down, you put photoresist. Every time you start a new layer, you have to flatten out the old layer. And so they take these little diamond pads and they basically grind the surface of the semiconductor to flatten it. And that's the type of technology they're using, is these brazed diamond pads. Um, with regard to semiconductors, we'll talk in the next couple of days about joining two semiconductors. What we have here, we have three things. This, this is actually a, a Pentium. Well, these are going back a few years. This is a Pentium. I don't have a Pentium 4. But this is what we call tape automated bonding. Bonding. There's the Pentium chip right there. And there's about three, 300 some leads, which are the leads that go to the chip, that have to be soldered on there. This is one of the housings. I don't have the chip anymore. But the chip goes, gets brazed, or gets soldered in the center, and then the ceramic brings out all these pin leads. Here's another lead of that. Um, going back to jet engines, this is an airfoil shape for one of the titanium inlet vanes for the engine for the F-22 jet fighter. And they basically have to have these air cooling passages. And this was a prototype design early in the, in the uh, stuff where they basically did diffusion bonding, and there's a seam line, so they actually took two pieces that had these cutouts, squeezed them together, and there's a... Uh, it could be for reducing weight there, rather than cooling. The vein, you're right, the inlet veins. Yeah. You're right, it's probably, that's probably just for reducing weight. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure, I'd have to go back and ask the student who gave it, it was a student who actually gave it to me. He was a student from Bratton Whitney, but in any case. Uh, another brazing application, this is one end of a pair of medical scissors. It's got a piece of hard, what, hard alloy brazed on the surface. These scissors will cost $300 when they're done because they're medical scissors, and they have this carbide insert. It's actually not carbide, it's stellite, but a uh, hard insert on the surface, so they never dull, or they very rarely dull. This is... Um, this has some sharp edges. This is an old pacemaker can. You know, pacemaker, you put in your heart, right? So you keep your heart going. This is made out of titanium for corrosion resist resistance, and it's welded together with a gas tungsten arc weld. One of the problems with this weld is the liner on the inside is plastic for the electronics to keep the electronics from shorting out to the case. And you have to weld to the outside surface without burning the plastic, which is right beneath it, which means you have to do things just right. Uh, another medical device that gets welded um, is this. This is a catheter. Anybody uh, have any, any relatives that have uh, been had a, a catheter, catheterization done on them? Uh, a balloon angioplasty or something like that? 
know where they, yeah, up there. Basically, they go in through one of your veins in your leg, and they take this long, stringy thing here, and they wind it up through your, your bloodstream, and they're taking x-rays all the time, and they, they can turn corners and stuff, and they finally get up here. This is the, what they call the guide wire. This is the lead wire in that you bring everything else up in. The tip is very flexible. The tip, this is a piece of stainless steel wire with its Teflon coated. And what I should have done, this thing used to be, well, don't kill yourself on this, okay? Uh, let's see if I can force it this way, okay. Um, that's probably okay. So it's, it's stiff back here, it's flexible on the tip. And what they've done is they've tapered down the tip to a much finer wire, which is nice and flexible, and then they actually wrap a spring, stainless steel spring around that, and then they have to weld that on the end to hold the spring to the, the other guide wire. The problem is if that weld fails, and that weld only has to take two or three pounds, but if it fails, as it's going through and it's up in your, in your blood vessels, you basically have a roto rooter now, when you try to pull it back out, the spring basically just abrades away the, the blood vessel walls and you probably kill the person, um, which is not what you intended. And they probably are not going to be happy. Actually, their relatives won't be happy, but their lawyers will be very happy. Um, in any case, so that weld's a pretty critical weld. Um, we'll talk about cutting of materials, thermal cutting. This is just an example of plasma cutting just a complex shape. You can look at the surfaces that were cut. Um, resistant spot welding, this is the way you put together the sheet metal in automobiles. As I say, there's 3,000 spot welds in the average automobile, because, or no, there's, I guess I say, yeah, there's 3,000 spot welds in the average automobile because you need 2,000 good ones, okay? And you basically, this actually process was invented by Elihu Thompson, who was the president of MIT. He was a professor of electrical engineering at MIT in the 1880s. And you bring, two, bring in two big copper electrodes, and you pass 10,000 amps for a third of a second, and you weld the thing together. There are, we'll go through the estimate on some of that. This is a different way. You can't do that reliably with aluminum. Um, on steel, you can get 2,000 spots before those copper tips wear out. On aluminum, the Nissan NSX, when they made it all aluminum, they were getting 44 spots before the, the copper tips wore out on the aluminum. So this is something Chrysler worked on where you had steel rivets to, to hold aluminum together for their all aluminum neon, which they made six prototypes of. This is basically just something soldered. This is a thermoelectric generator, and there's a bunch of lead, lead tellurium bismuth, I think, little semiconductor crystals and if you have apply heat to one side and cold to the other side, this thing will generate electric voltage. Okay, so it's basically a battery that operates off heat, if you will, or a heat gradient. Um, so I've got some other toys back in uh, my office, but to give you some idea of the different types of things that we have to talk about in the course. So that's a little bit more than I really wanted to spend on uh, um, uh, the introduction, but to some of these things are, <clears throat> we will talk about different things to give you, just, just to give you an idea. Now, I've got a couple minutes left, and what I wanted to do today was get into cold welding. Um, and actual, even before we get into cold welding, what actually causes things to want to bond together. Anybody have any questions about any of these things? Before we, uh, if we go back to the fundamentals of just chemical bonds, there's a certain strength to two atoms coming together to form a bond. Um, and different types of bonds, if you studied chemistry, even in high school chemistry, you probably learned there were these different types of bonds. Okay, There's ionic bonding, which is what? That's where you have charged atoms, like in sodium chloride crystal, positive atom and a negative atom, it's the electrostatic charge. There's covalent bonding, where the electrons are not transferred from one atom to another to create a charge, but they're shared between atoms. Silicon is an excellent example of covalent bonding. It forms this sp4 hybrid bond. There's metallic bonding, 
There's hydrogen bonding and Van der Waals bonding. Hopefully, most of you, you don't have to if you never studied this before, but hopefully you saw this somewhere in high school chemistry or freshman chemistry. In terms of the relative strength or energy of these bonds, anyone have any idea what the relative numbers are? I tend to use things in electron volts because it gives nice small numbers. Um, but typical strength of an ionic bond is one to three electron volts. Covalent bond is also on the order of one to three electron volts. And a metallic bond, depending on the metal, will also be in the range of one to three. A hydrogen bond typically is on the order of a third of an electron volt. And a Van der Waals bond is something on the order of 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 electron volts. Now, um, so there's about an order of magnitude, roughly, variation in the strength of these different types of bonds. There's also another type of bonding called dispersion bonding. Anybody know what dispersion bonding occurs in? It's sort of a quantum mechanical effect that, that occurs at very low temperature. It's what holds liquid helium together, OK? Because there's no electron charge transfer or electron sharing or any of these top three. And there's certainly no, so no asymmetric bond like in the hydrogen and Van der Waals. Dispersion bonding is sort of a quantum mechanical effect. And it's weaker by about an order of magnitude than Van der Waals bonding, and which is why it's only important at cryogenic temperatures. Thermal energy will rip apart a uh, very much th temperature will rip apart a, a dispersion bond. But the bonds that we're interested in at room temperature, we have these types of bonds. And these, these energies, if we, you're talking in a thermodynamic sense, are negative energies. If I bring together two iron atoms and they bond, and at room temperature they will bond, right? The energy is negative. They will give up energy in order to stay together as a solid or a liquid. If two atoms come together and the, the energy of attraction is net positive, what type of phase do we call that? We have solids, liquids, and gases, right? If two atoms come together and there is no net decrease in energy, they won't form a condensed phase. They'll form a gas and they'll fly off uh, and separate from each other. One of the things you need to learn to do in this class is also be able to, to estimate things on a very simple basis. What is, anybody have an idea of how far apart the atoms are or the molecules are in, this, in the air in this room? Or you, can you figure out how you might estimate it? And I will give you one piece of information. That one piece of information is that the <clears throat> relative density of air as a liquid is about 500 times greater than air in this room as a gas. So density of the liquid is about is equal to the density of the gas at room temperature times about 500. OK? Well, so? I mean, they're almost touching when they're in the, in the, in the uh, liquid or the solid, right? So how do I get the relative spacing in the gas at room temperature? I take the cube root of 500, right? Which is about 8 or something like that. So the gas molecules in this room are about 8 interatomic distances separated from each other. Um, and so those types of things are, can be important when we talk about uh, the attraction potentials, which we will talk about tomorrow, uh, so far as that goes. Uh, so we'll continue on the force of attraction of a bond. We'll prove that the strength of these bonds should be on the order of a million PSI. And I will also sh teach you tomorrow how to tear a th telephone book in two. And if you can figure out how you tie all this together, uh, you know, you can have an extra bagel for breakfast or something.